Well, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm delighted to see you all here. And as Crystalina says, I hope you're all going to take the opportunity of doing some of the experiments uh, around the, uh, the Ashmolean, and also taking part in some of the experiments we're going to be doing today. So some of you, no doubt, will be slightly intrigued by the title, The Visual Brain. Well, that's fine. The brain's in concerned with vision. But what about the, the House of Deceits of the Sight? Well, that all uh, came about because of this chap, uh, Sir Francis Bacon, who was all sorts of things. He was uh, a lawyer, statesman, philosopher, uh, reformer. He was also became the Attorney General, the Lord Chancellor. And as the way of uh, many uh, such individuals, politicians, etc., he ended up in disgrace. He was accused of uh, uh, taking money from various litigants, and uh, uh, it was a sad end. But one of the things that he, he did many, many things, but he produced this book called New Atlantis. And, um, and in this book, he was really the first, first person to describe how one, empiricism, and how one might use science to investigate the, natu uh, the natural world. And so he was the first person who suggested that Salomon's House, a research institute, with team, where there would be teams of researchers, so not the individuals that had been up to that point uh, looking into the natural, natural world, uh, they would collect data, which was sort of not really thought of in, in quantity, and they would conduct experiments. And he described how uh, the father of Salomon's House reveals the skill in creating illusions of light. We represent also all multiplications of light which we carry to great distance and make so sharp as to discern small points and lights. And all delusions and deceits of the sight in figures, magnitudes, motions, colors, all demonstrations of shadows. And what I want to spend the next hour is trying to show you how the visual brain itself produces its own deceits of the sight. So the questions I'm going to discuss in this talk First of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the brain processes the image of the visual world. And then I'm going to discuss whether the visual brain actually gives you a perfect representation of the outside world, so if, as if it was a box camera, or whether, in fact, the reality is created in our, our visual reality is created in our mind. And then I'm going to use, show you lots of visual illusions to see how they offer us a, vin a window on the neurobiology of vision. And lastly, as a clinical neurologist, I'm going to show you some uh, clips of patients who've had de damage to specific areas of the visual brain, which tell us something about the normal processing of that visual brain. So this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, this is by Turner, as most of you will recognize. Uh, and it's the beginning of the uh, railway uh, expansion revolution in, in Britain. And uh, the, uh, this bridge, in fact, is not very far from here, Maidenhead Railway Bridge, uh, um, designed by Brunel. And when um, Turner was standing here and trying to get all the various visual inputs, what was his visual brain trying to do? Well, it had to take the form of the bridge and the train. It had to take the various colors in. It had to take the depth as the train moved closer. And also, the train was moving, and in fact, it was, it was raining. And the, the uh, therefore, movement of all these objects he had to be processed within his visual brain. And I'm going to describe how we can use a variety of different techniques, such as recording from single cells in the visual brain, using uh, brain imaging to look at the visual brain, and lastly, to show, as I say, how patients with focal areas of damage give rise to a specific phenomenon. Now, let's start at the beginning in the eye. Uh, as many of you will be, know that the light comes into the eye and then uh, falls on two sets of receptors, the rods, which are for black and white vision, and the cones, which are for color vision. And um, the, the, there are three sets of cones which, ha which are responsible for our perception of different colors, so blue, green, and red. And many of you will have seen this. You've been to the opticians, and you'll be uh, sometimes in various jobs being tested for whether you've got uh, congenital color blindness. Uh, this is the Ishihara test plate. And uh, with an audience of, I don't know, 70 or so, there must be one or two of you who are red, green, color blind, and you'll have difficulty in seeing the five there and might make it out in a two and might make this eight, which most of us would see, into a three. So now the first, so let's have a look here. So this is very simple. There are four squares, and I want to use this to show you how our color uh, can be is perceived. 
And what I'm going to do is, if you, st if you keep staring at the cross, I'm going to put some colours in these uh, squares and keep, don't look at the colours, keep looking at the, the cross and then I'll just change back to the bl black and white squares and what you'll see, well, well you can tell me. So keep looking at the, s the cross in the middle and we'll do this for sort of five or six seconds or so and then we go back to those squares and very, very <laughs> rapidly but for a very brief period you'll see the complementary colours and this relates to uh, Herring's law of opponent theory of, of vision coming in the uh, 1870, 78, and the opponent colours are red and green and blue and yellow. And so what happened? How does that come about? Well, what happened was when you were looking at the reds and the greens, those particular uh, receptors, the red-green receptors, if you just take these two, were fatigued. And so there's a balance between all these receptors in the eye, and therefore, uh, when, we went, when you went back to the black and white afterwards, this pull-push pull competition briefly gave rise to the, the opponent colour, and then it went back to, uh, to normal. Clearly, if you just did that for a much longer period, it would persist for a slightly longer period after you'd gone back to the black and white squares. Now, is this uh, colourful bowl of fruit exactly as it looks? So, are there oranges here and apples and pears, etc.? And in fact, colour vision is a very, very complex uh, uh, way, uh, part of the visual system. Now, if you look at these two uh, shapes, exactly the same, exactly the same colour. But now, if, I, if you look at them here, and just put the numbers on them, now you can see that this one is much darker, or da certainly darker, than this one. Yet they're exactly the same. And somehow the visual brain has used all the content of the other colours and other shapes around them to distort the colour. So the reality of the colour, uh, the, the wavelengths that are reflected from this, are, dis are changed as a result of the surrounding structures. Now this is another um, example, of, and I think probably the best illusion that I know, of showing you that what we see is not necessarily what is actually there. So when you look at this, you can see that there's a checkerboard you can see this green dowel, and you can see there's a shadow. So presumably there's light coming in along here. Now keep looking at A and B, so the black square and the, uh, the white square. And I'm going to just cover up the areas between the two. So here we go. We'll just cover up the area. And now you can see that A and B are exactly the same. But the visual brain said, hang on a minute, B has to be a white square, and so we'll, look at it, we'll, we'll perceive it as, as dark, yet in fact it is identical. So this is an, an example of how the visual brain can distort the reality of your visual world. Now this is another example which some of you might have seen, but I think is a, an example not only of uh, the fact that what we see, or perhaps in this case what we don't see, uh, uh, is very important, but also that our visual brain is not able to take everything in. When I look at you all, my visual brain hasn't got the processing power to be able to analyse everything that's out there. So what I want you to do is this young lady here with the ponytail and the white T-shirt and the jeans, I want you to count how many book times she catches the ball as they swirl around. So what do you think? Eleven. Eleven? Golly. <laughs> any, any, any reduced numbers? <laughs> five. Yeah, five, five. I actually did it this morning myself because I never ever, uh, despite giving this lecture a few times, I never actually bothered to count it myself. But it is five. Uh, now, you're either all very polite, but how many of you saw the gorilla? Just put your hands up. Right. Well, so for those who didn't see the gorilla, Anybody going to admit that? Right. So, okay, so let's just run it again. 
And for those of you who, and if you do this as a proper experiment, you find that about 40% of, the, uh, of a group, say, of, of uh, <laughs> undergraduates will not see the gorilla. And so this is an example that we focus, you have focused your attention, your visual attention, on this young lady here and ignored everything else. And I think this is a very good example. When you're driving along and you're sort of looking at your phone, uh, you're not, and you think, oh, I'm just, I can see the road perfectly normally, by, uh, even though I'm doing that. But actually, you're not. You're, you have a very limited attentive content in your visual system, and therefore, you, if you're, for activities such as driving, you need to make sure you're using it fully. So Richard Gregory was a, um, a psychologist, um, spent most of his career in, uh, in Bristol, and he sort of proposed that, in fact, the visual brain is really a generator of hypotheses of what is out there in the visual world. So you have the reality of your visual world, which is processed and comes into the visual brain. Then you have a number of rules, some of which are uh, inherited if you, you, in your genes, some of them of which are learnt. And then you have knowledge, etc., perceptual knowledge, top down, which comes in again as, dur during, your, uh, during your life. And in fact, the visual brain is therefore a hypothesis generator. And why do we have a visual brain? Because it allows us to actually engage with our environment. Without vision, it becomes much more difficult. So we've talked a little bit about the eyes. So what we're going to do is the, the, the eyes project to the back of the brain uh, to what is called the striate cortex. And this is an area of the brain. This is looking at, what, at the, uh, the inner side of the brain. Uh, and this is the primary visual cortex and it actually has a, a map of the visual world and so one side has a map of the opposite side so if I damage this side then I would lose the vision on the contralateral side and just have half the vision if I make have a damage of a small area then I would lose the vision in a small area in the opposite side because there is an actual map and if I lose the bottom half then I'd lose the top half of the and so on now, how can understanding the primary visual cortex explain this, uh, these illusions? So here we've got some very nice parallel lines. Now, if you just add in these lines at different angles, you can see that the parallel lines have now become distorted and angled to each other. And here, those straight lines now have a nice clear bow on either side. Uh, and we can explain this by understanding what happens in the visual brain by recording from single cells. And this, in fact, goes back um, an, uh, a few decades to the work of Hubel and Weasel, who got the Nobel Prize for this. And they found that if you record from single cells in, the visual, in this, this per first part of the visual brain, you find that there are cells there that respond to a, a line of a particular orientation. So uh, this, this one, you can see, this is the firing pattern. So time is along here, and these little dark things are the spikes, the electrical activity of the, of the neuron. And you can see that if you show the, the um, same shape at different orientations, the cell doesn't fire. And if it's orthogonal to that, you can see it hardly fires at all. So there are whole sets in our visual brain, primary visual cortex, of neurons that respond to different orientations and different parts of our visual field. And they're organized in a very clever way. They're organized in what are called orientation selective columns. So if you put your electrode straight down into the, an area, you'll find that all the neurons respond to exactly the same orientation. But if you go at an angle and go across a number of different columns, you find that you go through a series of columns, each of which has an orientation that slightly changes as you move along. So when we look at a visual picture such as this, what we need to activate is a whole series of these columns, uh, of cells in these columns that relate to the, the uh, actual shape of the object that we're looking at. So coming back to the, this illusion, what is happening, therefore, is that there are interactions going on between these uh, orientation columns so that some are in slightly exaggerated and some are slightly inhibited and this gives rise to these visual distortions. These are some other pretty well known, or this one, the Kanitsa triangle uh, um, illusions, where despite the fact that really all you're seeing are a black circle with a white triangle taken out, 
There's no way that you can stop your visual brain from saying, well, there's a real triangle there. And in fact, this is even more uh, impressive, I think, that there's a clear white disk that has been placed on these lines, which doesn't exist. So th the interactions of these uh, columns in the first part of the visual processing area are very important for generating these sort of illusions. And it, again, in this audience, probably about five to ten of you will have migraine, and some of those people with migraine will have a visual aura. So with a visual aura, before you start getting the headache, you start seeing a small area in your visual field where it goes blank, and you often see this uh, shimmering, um, what's called a fortification spectra around the, ex, uh, around the edge, and it gets bigger and bigger. And sort of the, the, the idea of the uh, medieval fort with the fortifications, and then after about 20 minutes or so, it resolves, and then you get the headache. That's a typical. And we think that, in fact, the way that this comes about is because there is inhibition, uh, rather than excitation, inhibition of these, um, of these orientation uh, columns, which, uh, and there is a wave of this inhibition that spreads across our primary visual cortex, giving rise to these uh, scotomas. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about the primary visual cortex, but there's a very big area around this, which is called the extrastriate cortex. And vision is, the, pri is the, most, uh, the, the, the most important uh, perceptual sense. Uh, it takes up more of the brain than any other, uh, such as aud audition or somatosensory system. Now, one of the um, interesting areas in, in neuroscience in general for the last 150 years has been the whole question of functional specialization. So this, the, this uh, talks about, is, are there areas of the brain which are, control, uh, are specific for different functions? So are there areas of the brain concerned with uh, movement, another area that's concerned with uh, vision, another area that's concerned with hearing, and so on. Uh, now, Gall, who many of you will have heard of in relation to phrenology, thought there was no doubt that there was functional specialization uh, or personality specialization, and he could, do, he, could, uh, um, a, a, he could identify this by feeling the lumps and bumps on the head. Uh, and, uh, of course, that there was no uh, validity to this whatsoever. Uh, and there's been a debate that's gone on for over 100 years as to, to what extent there is functional specialization. Now, what about functional specialization in this area around the primary visual cortex? So the question then is, is there an area that is specific for color? Is there one for motion? Is there one for depth? And so on. So let's talk a little bit about color. So why do we have color? Here you can see uh, two scenes, and it's difficult to make out quite what's going on. As soon as you have color vision, you can see that down here, you've got something that's potentially a predator. And also, you can see here the bananas that suddenly become much more obvious. So, you know, a few uh, uh, millennia ago, when you are on the savanna, this color vision would have been very important, not only from the point of view of identifying food that was uh, edible and that which was not edible, and also identifying um, predators. Now, rather a long time ago, I, uh, with some colleagues, when I was in London, uh, with uh, Samir Zeki and Richard Fakoviak and Christian Luak, thought that it would be very interesting to see whether in the human visual brain there was evidence of functional specialization. So in those days, there weren't the fancy scanners that we have now, but there was what are called PET scanners. And basically, you gave an injection uh, of a radioactive tracer, uh, and then you'd ask the subject to look at certain objects, and you'd record the amount of radioactivity in different parts of the brain. So if you ask the subjects, and these are normal subjects, to look at this multicolored sort of Mondrian-type picture, and you record this, you can see that this is the front of the brain, this is looking from the side, this is looking from the front, and this is looking down on the brain. You can see that there is a lot of activity at the back of the brain, our visual brain, which is processing this. And this is just comparing the amount of activity there is when you close your eyes to when you're looking at this. So now what we, we then did was to say, OK, let's compare what happens when they look at this, but compare it with the same forms, the same amount of light coming out, but now there is no color. 
And this is what we found. This is the old one. You can see all the activity here. And now you can see that all this activity has largely gone because in the two, uh, in both the black and white and the color, it cancels itself out. But now you can see the only difference between those two sets of images was color. You can see there are two areas on either side of the midline here lying on the low, uh, the undersurface of the, uh, of the brain, at the back of the brain here in the occipital lobe. So this, we thought, was good evidence that there was a specific color area in the human visual brain. Now, that's all very well. That's a very nice, uh, a nice demonstration. But the next step would be to say, if there was damage in that particular area, then what would the patient actually experience? And what we would expect is that they would lose their color vision. But all other aspects of their vision, motion, form, etc., would be intact. And indeed, here's a patient who has damage. This black area here is an area where they had a small stroke which damaged that area that we found on those scans to be involved in color. And this is what the individual uh, described, that he could see everything uh, on both, all over the, his visual world, but there was a complete loss of color on the contralateral side. Everything was moving. So, so he, he had this phenomenon uh, he, could, he could draw things completely normally. So these are some examples, bananas, um, a peach, a, uh, whatever that is, a cherry. But he couldn't get the right color. And this is a condition called achromatopsia, which is an acquired disorder of color perception, but with everything else preserved. So the motion, uh, depth, and form are preserved. Now, it's very always interesting, uh, I don't speak German, but always interesting to go back to literature a few hundred, a uh, hundred or so years ago. And if you go back to 1888, there was a Swiss ophthalmologist called Louis Verre, who in fact described such a patient with just a complete loss of color, but intact, every, every, all the rest of his vision was intact. And the patient died, and there weren't any fancy scans or anything like that, there was just a pathological specimen. And you can see, this is looking at the bottom of the back of the brain, and this red area shows that there's an area of softening where this patient had a small stroke. And so he was the first person to actually describe achromatopsia due to a focal damage to this, what is called the lingual and fusiform gyrus, this, in, this area of the visual brain. Over 100 years, people ignored this, they debated it, uh, and it wasn't until the 1980s or so when people really uh, appreciated that there was indeed a color area in this region of the brain. Now, Monet, as you know, uh, was prone to uh, painting series of pictures. And in 1892, uh, he went along to, uh, he rented a garret uh, opposite the facade of Rouen Cathedral, and he started painting this wonderful series of pictures. And you can see that here he's painted it in bright sunlight, here in twilight, here on a rather gloomy day, cloudy day, etc., etc. So the question is, is that what he actually saw, or that, is that his interpretation of what he saw, or as an impressionist, is that his impression of what he saw? Now, if we look at this leaf and an orange here, and we show what happens under two sets of illumination. So our color vision is completely dependent on the reflection of the objects in front of us of the different wavelengths that come into our eye. And you can see what happens here in relation to daylight and fluorescent light. And here is the leaf, and this is the wavelengths along here. And you can see this is the pattern of wavelengths that are reflected into the eye with, under daylight, and very different with a leaf. And again, here you can see the oranges, the, or the orange color, and you can see again how different it is when you see that under fluorescent light. <coughs> now, if we look at this bowl of fruit, under fluorescent hazy daylight and clear blue sky, you can see that we maintain our ability to perceive the color. It might be slightly ch uh, changing in tone, but the colors are still there. And this is a phenomenon called color constancy. And the visual brain is very, very clever in what is known as discounting the illuminance. So it doesn't really matter what illumination, exactly what are the reflected wavelengths that come back into the eye, we're still able to make out these different colors. And this is... Uh, a, a very, a, 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 something that we really don't understand exactly how this comes about in the visual brain, uh, but it's, a, it's one of the sort of features that is very important for us to be able to maintain our perception of color. Now, what about motion? 
So I'll come back now to that experiment that I showed you uh, about five minutes ago with colour vision of doing a scan in somebody who was looking at, at a coloured Mondrian and then a black and white Mondrian. So if there is functional specialisation, we, we, I said that it seems that there is this area that is involved in colour. But if there is really functional specialisation, we have to show that a different modality of vision, a different attribute of vision, such as motion, is, is, uh, causes activation in a different area to the colour area. So the same subjects then were looking at this uh, set of dots, static dots, and then the dots were moving in a random way. And we made a comparison of the scans of the activation of the brain in these two situations, with, the, scat with the, uh, the dots static and the dots moving. And we now found that, in fact, there is a different area. You can see the area we showed before for colour was on the inferior surface, the bottom of the brain. And now you can see here, the back, this is the back of the brain. Just in, uh, in front of this, uh, the complete back of the brain, there is this area that becomes active in relation to motion. So this appeared to be a motion area. So now we've got two completely separate areas, one concerned with colour, one concerned with motion, which provides some evidence for functional specialisation. And we know now that from uh, lots of experiments that have been done in various um, mammals, that in this area that we showed on the scan, there are neurons, single cells, that fire in response to objects moving in, uh, in certain directions. So these are what are called movement-sensitive neurons. Now, what happens if you fatigue these neurons? So uh, what I'd like you to do is to just look here at the branch sitting in the waterfall and just keep looking at it for a few seconds. And we'll just stop the waterfall. And now you should all see that you've got, for a few seconds, a reverse waterfall. And this is, needless to say, the waterfall illusion. In fact, it was first described by Aristotle. And what we think has happened here is that while you were watching everything moving down, this caused fatigue in a population of these directionally selective motion neurons. And therefore, when you looked at the static picture, there was the balance between the the, all the sets of mo movement uh, neurons was disturbed. And for that brief two or three seconds, you saw the reverse movement of the waterfall. Here is a, another example of how we can um, make up the idea that if things are moving in a certain way, we know what it is. So the, here you'd say, well, look, there are these little dots. Some, you know, looks like a, perhaps a bit of a tree or something. As soon as they start moving, you immediately know that these are dots that are attached to an individual. So our, mo our, mo our movement uh, ability to understand these various, how these interact with each other, is very, very refined. Now, what about static images? Bridget Riley, as you know, was one of the pioneers of op art. And here you can see, and some of you, if you look at this, you'll start seeing that there's a shimmering effect. There's a movement in this, uh, in this image. And here's another example. If you just look here, you can see that this is a, um, a yellow disc with a series of blue rings around it. Now, if I make it into the a picture by uh, Leviant called Enigma, and just keep looking at the yellow disc. And what you'll start seeing is that there are swirls going on in those blue circles, and sometimes they're moving clockwise, and sometimes they're moving anti-clockwise. Now, how do we explain this? Because there's no movement, these are static images, yet our visual brain, our motion area, is actually becoming activated as a result of this. If you do a scan, in fact, while the subject body is looking at that image, you in fact find, indeed, that there is activation of that area, the motion area, at the back of the visual brain. Lots of different uh, possible mechanisms have been described, but probably the most likely explanation is that our visual brain is continually making series of small uh, eye movements, just moving, we make about three little fast movements, tiny little movements, which we're not aware of every second, and these little movements, or even micro-movements, are sufficient to activate these motion uh, detectors and give rise to the illusion of movement on these static images. Now again, I pointed out that there was this area on the lateral side of the brain that seemed to be involved in uh, motion. To really sort of um, confirm this or get more evidence for this, we'd want to know what happens if you damage specifically that area and leave the rest of the visual brain intact. 
Now, such patients are incredibly rare. There is one German lady who had this who's been uh, sort of around various visual physiology laboratories for about 30 years. And there, in fact, is her, uh, her, break, her scan. And you can see on either side, this little white area here is an area of damage. And it lies right in the region of the visual uh, motion area that we had described before. So she was very fortunate in having just very short lived And presumably, this was some uh, reduced perfusion of blood that just seemed to pick off this uh, area. Very remarkable. But anyway, uh, evidence uh, for that. So now we've got, uh, if we put this together, we've got our primary visual cortex, where the visual input from the eyes comes straight in. And now we've got a color area on the bottom here and a motion area on the side here. What about uh, depth? Well, this is a sort of wonderful uh, Hogarth of perceptual uh, absurdities. And here you can see, of course, the man standing on the hill is having his pipe lit by the lady leaning out of the house over here and the fishing sort of a few, a few hundred meters away um, along a long line and so on. Motion, we have a lots of different cues for, uh, uh, sorry, of, of depth, lots of different cues that allow us to perceive depth. Uh, there is perspective. Shadowing gives us inf some information. There is occlusion, so obviously the objects that are here that are occlude the objects behind. This must be in front, closer to us than those behind. We have fine stereopsis. If you thread a needle, into, uh, thread a, put a thread into a, the head of a needle, you use fine stereopsis. And there is relative motion, so that things that are close to you move more swiftly than things that, such as the moon that are further away. Now here uh, you can see that these two grim uh, individuals, uh, exactly the same, uh, same size, etc. But as soon as we put them into this uh, perspective, you can see now that it appears in your visual brain, and whatever you say to yourself, you can't stop your visual brain from saying, this guy is bigger than this guy. And what's interesting, I think, is, and I don't know whether you, you agree, but when you look at it like this, you sort of see that this chap looks rather angry and this person looks terrified. <laughs> but they're exactly, so the visual brain has somehow said, well, this is a normal situation where this chap's being chased, therefore he'd be angry, he'd be uh, afraid, and you interpret the face in that way. Uh, you'll have seen the Pozo illusion, two lines are exactly the same when you put them uh, along these uh, parallel, or these lines that c converge you can uh, see that they now, this one appears to be much shorter than this one. Now, uh, you've all got these spectacles, so now is the time to don the spectacles. And it <coughs> uh, um, doesn't really matter, but uh, try the green on the left. Now, I have to sort of see what I'm doing. Actually, I think, uh, I think we'll start, why don't we start, yeah, to start with the green on the right. Now, those of you who've got good stereoscopic vision should see that there is a, um, a diamond that is in front of the rest of the image. Yep. So th this is a, what are called random dot stereograms that were devised by a visual scientist, Bella Ulez, who worked in the Bell Laboratories in the States. And really, what, what he's done is he's moved these, uh, they're two sets, red and green squares, and you're only able to see each set uh, separately by the, in the two eyes when you wear the glasses. And what he's done is he's moved a certain subset of these uh, one, set, one color of the squares in a certain way. So here he'd move a triangle uh, or um, yeah, a diamond-shaped pattern, move it slightly to the left or the right. In fact, if we go back to this one, um, if you just now turn it round so that you're now looking from the green, you'll in fact see that the diamond is deeper in the uh, screen than, than it was. And keep them on, and we'll just, just show you uh, an, another uh, couple. Here you can see that the line even the line doesn't stop us seeing this, um, uh, the diamond. So the visual brain is able to compute this. And you imagine, this is a phenomenal feat of, uh, of computation to be able to pick up these changes of these tiny little pixels of color 
and put them together and say that there's this group that are slightly changed. And here's another one. <laughs> and now you should see a set of squares that are coming out towards you. And, and they come out, and, and if you've noticed, you can see these incredibly quickly. So the computation is happening at a, at a phenomenal, f uh, and this one is more difficult. So you have to see, you see there are a lot more square, a uh, lot more dots in this, and you just have to keep looking. And eventually, and I've got it now, anybody got it? The spiral coming out towards you, if you've got the uh, green on your left, over your left eye, or going in the other way around. So this is, th this is um, an example of uh, stereoscopic vision, a very, very fine stereoscopic vision. Okay, so you can put those away, uh, but please give them back at the end. So what about face perception? Uh, this, of course, is the most developed visual perceptual skill in humans. And if you just look again at this uh, seemingly uh, sort of uh, vase, which... Uh, but then if you keep looking at it, you'll flip between two different things. You should start seeing faces in the black faces and then the vase and flip back and forward. Anybody know who the faces are? Yeah, well, I must say, I, I showed this many, many times. I've never, uh, it took me a long time to realize, of course, that it is the Queen and <laughs> Prince Philip. And so why is face perception so important? Well, because, of course, all social interactions are dependent on our ability to perceive the face. It tells us about the identity of individuals, their background, whether they're in a good mood or a bad mood, uh, where they're looking. If you think back sort of uh, to the savannah again, if you're talking with somebody or grunting at somebody and something they see in their peripheral vision, they suddenly move their eyes and they see, that, and, uh, the, they, you want to be able to see they move their eyes, and when they move uh, far, fast away from a predator or something like that, that they move again uh, the same way. And it also enhances our comprehension of speech. So sometimes if you've, uh, in the days of sort of pretty fuzzy uh, televisions with poor aerials, it will sometimes be quite difficult to understand what somebody was saying without being able to see clearly what, how their mouth was moving. But, our, but we're used to seeing faces in certain ways, and you could all be able to, um, to recognize George Bush, upside down, probably appropriate. Uh, and, but what you probably won't appreciate, until I show you this way, that in fact his eyes and his mouth have been inverted by 180 degrees. So even though I show you this now, if I show it to you again, you'll still find difficulty uh, in, un in perceiving that. So we have a certain rigidity in our face uh, processing that um, sh uh, really maximizes it when the, he the face is looking the right way around. So th there it is again. Now here's a, a, um, a mask, a face mask, and let me just, let's just start to the beginning. So here you've got the convex side of the face mask, okay? Now it's turning round. Now you're moving to the concave part, and now you're coming back to the convex part. But your visual brain says, hey, hang on, I've never seen a concave face. <laughs> and so it just reinterprets it as a convex face, which is used to seeing. And it's an amazing illusion, actually, because you just you know, cannot stop yourself seeing it that way. Now, for many, many uh, decades, there was a big debate uh, among visual neurophysiologists as to whether there was a hierarchy of processing in the visual, um, visual system uh, in the brain. So was there these simple cells that would record movement or would record uh, orientation, that they all combined together all the way along the system until you got the grandmother cell, a cell or a little group of cells that, for example, would read only fire when you saw the face of your grandmother. And for many, many decades, it was thought this was nonsense. That there was a, 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 um, a general processing of vision across all the visual um, system. But then in the 1980s, there were some electrophysiologists who started putting their electrodes in this region of the brain. So this is the back part of the brain that we've been talking about, slightly more anterior on the uh, lateral surface of the brain in what's called the temporal lobe. And um, 
David Perrett and colleagues and many others did these experiments and they found that indeed there are what we call face selective neurons. So here you can see the, uh, this is a, a monkey's face that is being put into the receptive field of this particular neuron in that region. So you're recording the spike activity and you can see that the cell and it, the, the image is being presented to the visual field for this particular neuron during the period of that line. And you can see as soon as the uh, face is presented in that, there is a big increase in the firing of the neuron and then it gradually comes down and then it stops. If you take all those parts of the face and jumble it all up, so it's no longer a face, but exactly the same content of the face, you can see the cell's not interested in firing. And you can take different parts of the face away <coughs> and you get less and less activity. If you actually show uh, the face of the experimenter, you can see that you get a sort of not a bad um, response because, you know, he's not that far away from a monkey. A hand, on the other hand, gives you no response at all. So we now know <coughs> excuse me, that there are these face-selective neurons. And the color brain is, has been identified using uh, functional imaging in the human brain. And we now know that there are areas on the bottom of the brain. So this is the part where there was a color area here. Now, if you just go slightly anterior to that, you find that there is what is called the fusiform face area. And there are these other areas where they was, had been sticking their electrodes in the monkey, the uh, superior temporal sulcus. So what we can do now is say that in addition to the color and motion, we've now got a face recognition area. Important. <coughs> so here you can see a cube uh, written, uh, drawn two-dimensionally. And when you look at it, you'll sometimes, it'll start flipping back and forth. So sometimes you'll see that this is the surface that is protruding out from the screen. And sometimes you'll see, uh, well, I can't even see it myself now. Uh, sometimes you'll see the other one which is protruding out. And if I just show you here, you can see. And this is what is called the Necker cube. Another Swiss, in fact, a crystallographer, who, who described this in 1832 when he was looking at crystals under a microscope and he saw that they appeared to be flipping back and backwards and forwards. And this, as I say, is called a multi or bistable illusion. You flip between this one protruding out and this one protruding out. Now, this is just a, a scan, an, ac an active scan of somebody looking at a sort of hominoid type in, uh, uh, person here and then it'll be lots of lines, black and white lines, and you'll see how the activation will change. See, this is for the lines, and then the lateral parts get activated with the hominoid object. So, lots of experiments have been done in relation to uh, perception of objects, and in fact, what one finds is that there are groups of neurons that some of which are particularly involved in our identification, say, of houses, of faces we've talked about, or of chairs, and they they vary in their lo location. They, they are, uh, it's not a specific, obviously, um, a specific separation, but there are just gradual um, inclines towards being able to perceive chairs here and on the other side, houses, and then you have your faces in the middle. So again, what happens if you damage this area? So we would we'd expect but what happens is that the individual would not be able to identify an object, although he or she will be able to see it and describe it in great detail. So this is a condition called visual agnosia, an inability to recognize visualized objects. And this is another patient who has such a, pro a problem. So looking here at a Christmas tree, and this is his wife. Is that 
So, so he would go on sort of describing all this and, uh, and having increasing difficulties. And he's a, he was a, a company exec, a very intelligent guy who'd had an appendix removed and then uh, had a small stroke which affected this little tiny area of the visual brain which is involved in our perception of objects. And you can think of it uh, rather nicely described by this American psychologist, Teuber, as a normal percept, so he perceives everything normally, but it's stripped of its meaning. So if you ask him to copy these objects on the left, you can see he does it pretty well. If you ask him to draw freehand, you can see he's actually better at inanimate objects than doing animate objects. Um, and in fact here, you can see his description. I hope you all immediately say that's a pepper pot and that's an onion, if not, We've got some very interesting experiments to do later. Um, and you see he can describe this. So it's a stand containing three separate pans, one, two, three. The top one has a design on it, the hole. The second pan is slightly smaller diameter, and so on. He'll go on and on describing it, but he'll never be able to tell you that that is a pepper pot. And this one, which he thinks might be a necklace of sorts. So we now have a, a face and object recognition area here. And so, putting all this together, we appear to have a group of different areas of the visual brain which are concerned with processing different parts. So some are concerned with processing uh, faces, some with color, some with uh, location, some with movement. And this has been put together into the concept of a what and where pathway. So this is the, vis this is the brain, this is the back part of the brain that the visual input comes in here, and it moves along this region as to where things are, and movement, and it moves along here to what they are, color and form. And we now know that this is a, I mean, I've talked about four or five different centers of the visual brain. We know from experiments in non-human primates that there are many more. There are probably about 30 different uh, areas, all concerned with vision, and all presumably having slightly different uh, involvement in our visual percept and that there are many many thousands of different sets of connections and what's important to remember although we think if this is the eye here and that all this processing is going along to higher areas of visual processing that there's a huge amount of activity which is feeding back into the system so it's a forward and backward system that allows us to have our visual percept now some of you might be thinking that there's a problem because if you look at this little blue ball moving backwards and forwards, what I've been saying is that this little area here would tell us that it's a blue ball. This little area here would tell us the, the form, that it is round. And the area here would tell us that it's moving. But they're all separate, different areas. So how does it all come together into our visual percept? And this is what is called the binding problem. And this is, uh, for any future neuro visual neuroscientists sitting in the audience, <coughs> this is the big uh, problem we don't really understand. One of the uh, many, many hypotheses that have been put forward, but one that says that there is a transient synchronization of neuronal discharges in each of those areas that bind dynamically the the inputs in those areas and allow us to actually give rise to our percept of a visual object. So what I hope I've told you, tried to describe is that the visual brain isn't a mere chronicler of external physical reality. Uh, it's actually an active participant in generating our visual percept and it has its own rules and programs. So the last word is, to look is to create what you see. Thank you very much.